Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, ho hosted by ESI Africa in collaboration with African Utility Week and PowerGen Africa Conference, which is scheduled for the 12th to the 14th of May in 2020 in Cape Town. I'm Nicolette pombe editor of ESI Africa, and your moderator for today's discussion. Our topic for today is about South Africa's power strategy, or lack thereof, and the country's energy mix and utility business model. Joining me are four energy sector professionals who are ready to provide insight and answer your questions on the scenarios of an unbundled utility, the role of municipalities in today's energy landscape, the transition from the predominant use of fossil fuels, and the best case scenario for uh, the cost and supply of energy. Before I introduce our guest speakers, please take note of the following. Note that a recording of the webinar will be made available to you on our website tomorrow. Our website is www.esi-africa.com. To ask our guest speakers a question during the discussion, use the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. We will do our best to get to as many as possible. Some of our guest speakers have prepared a short presentation for you. These will also be made available to you on our website tomorrow, as well as during this live broadcast. For those of you who have just joined us, welcome. Allow me to introduce our guest speakers. Naraj Menta from Frost & Sullivan, Nshlanshla Ngidi from Salga, Vuvu Mahangela from General Electric, Silas Zimu from African Energy Corporation, who will be joining us in a short while. To find out more about our guests, you are welcome to toggle through the tabs at the top of your screen. To start off with, I'm going to ask each of our guest speakers to give a short introductory statement to just lay the, the uh, environment for you as to how they see the energy sector at the moment. Naraj, can I ask you to please do your opening statement? Uh, thank you, Nicolette, and a very good afternoon to everybody on this platform. My name is Neeraj, and I'm a consultant with the industrial team at Frost & Sullivan, focusing on expertise in the energy and power sector. So I will be focusing a lot on the unbundling and presenting my thoughts on the unbundling of utilities that we are talking about, specifically related to ESCOM. So what we foresee going forward for ESCOM is a vertical unbundling where we're talking about three different entities on the generation, transmission, and the distribution side, and a further unbundling on the generation and distribution side where there can be more competition in terms of power generation and also sale of power. Now, it would be very easy to assume that this unbundling would be to improve the current inefficiencies that are being observed within the ESCOM. But this is not completely the case. If we look at it globally, energy utilities are facing challenging situations. And these challenges are due to multiple reasons. One of the foremost being the change in the customer preferences, which is one of the key factors. There is a growing contribution and footprint of distributed generation. There are shifts in policy and regulations. There is rising competition from technology providers and independent power producers. The cost of renewable energy is on the decline and so is the cost of energy storage. And also power infrastructure is on the decline in terms of age and also there is a growth in the smart concept. Now when we're talking about changing business models for the electricity supply industry, we're looking at a transition wherein the supply industry is moving from a centralized generation to something that we call as a distributed generation wherein the consumer of electricity is also the producer, and there are multiple producers that feed into a common grid that comprises of storage, electric mobility, and smart homes as well. So this is a transition that is currently happening in the electricity supply industry. And we are moving towards a mode wherein communication is bidirectional in all states and all phases of the value chain. 
is not only from the generation to the end customer and the end customer back to the generation and the transmission entities, but it is across all these facets of the electricity supply industry. Now, if we look at this particular slide, we're talking about the top trends that are shaping the future of the power industry. We're talking about the development of virtual power plants. We're talking about smart grids. We're talking about a lot of distributed energy. We're talking about microgrids. Then we're talking about energy and electricity as a service, not as a commodity. We are talking about the inclusion of performance contracting, the use of cloud services for data analysis, as well as demand, respo demand response management, which helps manage the electricity grid better. So basically, we are talking about utilities moving from a centralized station towards something that is more distributed, that involves a lot of storage, involves EV infrastructure coming into place, as well as utilities looking at providing more customer-centric solutions, something like smart homes, like energy storage solution, and also distributed generation facility at the customer location, in addition to what we call as demand response and management, as well as distributed energy resource management. Now, if you look at this slide in specific, we are talking about utilities actually shifting focus from their existing business models towards being more customer-centric, where you're providing distributed energy services, this energy warehousing, this smart solutions, and also utilities that are now focusing on just managing the entire grid, something like a virtual power plant. So this is how the focus of utilities is shifting globally, and we see many utilities actually adopting these business models. Last but not the least, as I mentioned, the driving forces for these changes that we are seeing in the utilities and in the business models is the integration of renewable energy and energy storage. It's the rise of distributed generation business models, rise of digitalization, and the most important aspect, growing customer engagement. So to put it in a very short, concise way, I see unbundling as an opportunity for ESCOM going forward to stay ahead of the technology curve and create new opportunities for itself. Very well said, Naraj. Thank you so much. And then, Nchlanjla, I welcome you to present your opening statement. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nchlanjla Ngiti. Uh, as for the introduction, I'm from Sauda, and I am heading a uh, the electricity and energy uh, value chain uh, in Salga. Um, my responsibilities in Salga at this point in time is to lead uh, the reform of the industry and uh, to lead the policy shift that needs to enable the, 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 the reform of the industry and for municipalities to be able to align themselves with the, uh, the, the change in, or the energy transition. So my slides, uh, a couple of my slides are going to talk about what can municipalities do to avoid uh, transferring cost of embedded generation onto consumers, and also some of the business models and strategies that municipalities can put in place to respond to the energy transition. But now, uh, before I go to my presentation, there is a challenge about you know, the South African industry structure. It's quite unique. It's not the same as the industry structure in other countries. Our reform or the restructuring or the unbundling of the industry is not just talking about a, a, a state utility only. I think uh, this is where we are unique. We have about 176 municipalities who are part of the structure of the industry. But other countries have been unbundling just one state entity that has been supplying the whole country without any municipalities doing the work that that state of entity has been doing. So we are, in, we are unique in that manner, and this is why um, my view is it looks like we have different industries when it's not the case. We have one industry, then we need a holistic view of how we need to take it forward and not, and, and not isolate uh, the other industry and look at the other. I support the unbundling of ESCOM very much, but uh, at this point in time, it needs to be coupled in parallel 
with the restructuring that needs to happen in the whole electricity, electricity supply industry of the country. So these are some of the current realities that uh, the, 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 the industry is going through at this point in time. Uh, and if I may rehash again, these realities that we are going through now are the realities that as South Africa, when we decide to do restructuring back in 2010 and beyond that, we were faced with the same reality. So probably now we are in a worse situation than we were at when we are trying to um, do the restructuring uh, of more than 10 years ago. Um, and I can even confirm that when we were trying to do the restructuring 10 years ago, we were at a better financial state in terms of the economy was growing, uh, the money was coming in, no utility was being owed, all utilities were making money, they were breaking even and even making margin. But now we are at a worse of situation that is actually forcing us to change the way we do things. But unfortunately, the money, the cash is not there anymore. So we, need, we really need to think differently and out of the box if we are, we are to come out of this current situation that we are going through. So without going through all the, the realities, but the issues around infrastructure, uh, they are, the prices are going up, obviously, because now economies of scale are shrinking. Um, the business of kilowatt is actually going down as well. So um, the sales are going down. Um, but now what, what's happening is the utilities are trying to respond to this by pushing the prices up. And this is not helping the situation because customers now have a choice. And this is why in the current, current transition, the customer is going to be king because we are not going to have captive customers anymore. We're going to have customers that have a choice. Customers that have a choice to do their own generation. Customers that have a choice to actually do their own initiatives to have to self-sustain themselves with regards to energy. So in the future going forward, the customer is going to be quite key. And the business models of municipality and ESCOM, they need to put the customer uh, first uh, because the customers now do have a chance. They are not captive anymore. Um, so delving into the business models, I've got eight business models that are possible that can be done by municipalities at this point in time. But obviously, this must be coupled by the national strategy on how to look at the whole industry. Because at Salka, we are looking at municipalities and how they should respond to the energy transition, but there is a state-owned entity that is going through the same challenges that the municipalities are going through. And that is why we are saying this restructuring must go hand in hand. We must not do the other in isolation of the other. But um, I'm going to go quickly through the eight business models that I have uh, outlined in my presentation that municipalities can do to respond to the situation. Obviously, digitization and smart uh, cities going forward is going to be the talk of the day. So all these business models, they must uh, include the digitization part of things. They must include a smart part of things. There must be smart grid, smart system. But going back to the business model one, this is where now municipalities must be able to own and operate their own generation capacity, especially the renewable uh, energy capacity. Um, the state owned entity, obviously, at generation level is having problems. Uh, municipalities, they, by constitution, they must increase the services or access to services for the people. So municipalities must be allowed to do their own generation, use the new technology storage in order to increase and continue increasing access to services for the people. Business model two, that's where municipalities, instead of building themselves, because obviously cash is, is, is trapped at this point in time, um, they can procure electricity from uh, other plants or other independent power producers. Uh, business model three, the municipalities can be bridging agents. They can actually do trading and do the facilitation through their networks. So they can actually engage themselves in their wire business as well. Uh, the, the fourth business model, uh, that is where the, the municipalities can even introduce 
the energy advisory services in their business model as well, which is something that's currently being done by private sector. Going through the fifth business model, uh, which has not been tested yet, where municipalities through the government grants that they get for infrastructure can start extending services of higher purchase options for customers uh, on PV installations where they install uh, you know, PV in, in new customers and have some sort of a contract or agreement with them where they will be paying back um, some money to the municipality toward that installation. So that's another business model as well. Uh, business model six, uh, that's where municipalities will also, um, I'm going to make an, an example like a big township we have in South Africa, like Soweto. If a municipality would have an agreement with all Soweto residents and use their roof as a power plant, actually you could have uh, enough energy to, 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 to supply the whole of the township and get rid of the current 18 billion um, debt that is being owed to Elcom by that township. Uh, business model seven, uh, that's where now, um, you know, coming to the, the storage uh, system, which are the prices are a bit uh, questionable at this point in time because uh, it's a bit expensive. But going forward, as you know, technology evolves and uh, the prices uh, get reduced. So municipalities could also get into the business of storage, um, going into a power purchase agreement with uh, commercial buildings and bigger companies where they uh, become the bankers of the energy and sell the energy at peak hours as well. The eighth business model is what I'm looking at as a bigger picture, where we now start we need to start reforming. We can't continue to have 180 distributors in the country. We need to consolidate. We need to scale down so that uh, there won't be uh, fragmentation uh, in terms of the the the, 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 the economy of scale. Uh, there will be also regulatory issues. Regulators must deal with less and less utilities than dealing with the locks. So there must be a, a lot of uh, consolidation that must be done. Uh, this consolidation can also even be assisted by the current unbanding that is taking place at ESCOM, where if there are, um, there, there, there are worries or concerns about the loss of jobs, uh, there's a lot of engineers from ESCOM that could actually go and help the reformed or the, the consolidated utilities at a, at, at a municipal level. So in closing, I'm not going to go through that whole slide, but in closing, we still need to test this and have some uh, pilot projects that must give us you know, evidence around the success. We must also test you know, the current policy environment if it really allows for those uh, business models. And I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chancellor. It sounds like there are a lot of concerns, uh, but that the opportunities are there for municipalities to step up. Uh, Vuvu, I'd like to ask you to please give your opening statement. Good day, everyone. Um, I'd like to take a different approach to my fellow speakers, um, and I'd like to start by briefly outlining three key global trends that we're seeing unfolding in the power sector that we're certainly tracking um, as General Electric so that we understand how to translate these into regions that we operate in and countries, specifically um, Sub-Saharan Africa. These three trends that we're seeing across the energy ecosystem. Hi, uh, it seems that uh, Vuvu's line has dropped. Um, I'd like to just continue by looking at a stay question that I am going to ask our listeners to participate in. And uh, this is a question that looks at whether you believe that ESCOM will be formally declared bankrupt within 12 months, therefore negating the proposal to unbundle the sector. Um, if you can please respond to that survey question. So, to continue, um, we did receive quite a few questions from the audience when they were registering, and I've selected a number of them 
for our guest speakers to uh, respond to. So I'd like to start off with Nshlanshla. If you can respond to the question around um, somebody that has asked, what are the disadvantages of unbundling ESCOM and establishing the independent grid operator? Hi, uh, thank you very much, Nicole, uh, for that. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think my quick answer to that uh, to that question is first, look at the as common bundling um, decision. What is it that we're trying to solve? I, I think that's the question we really haven't asked ourselves. What are we trying to solve? In my assumption, what we are trying to solve is the, the problem, the financial problem of ESCOM, the money is not getting in, the debt is becoming too much, uh, the net, what ESCOM can actually um, get as uh, a revenue. So now, what are we trying to solve? Uh, we are trying to solve ESCOM financial issues. Then at the end of the day, look at the first phase of the unbundling. It's going for the wire business, which is uh, the, the, the independent power, uh, the independent system and market operator. It, it's trying to get the system operator out of ESCOM. Can we get the reason if that independent system operator as the first phase will solve the current financial problem of ESCOM? I'm going to go back to the problem, to, 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 to my first question. What are we trying to solve? We are trying to solve the issues of finance. The money is not coming in. ESCOM is being owed. And where does the money come from at the level of ESCOM in the vertical integrated uh, nature of ESCOM? Where is the money supposed to be coming from? It mostly should come from distribution. It mostly should come from the buyer as well. But now, why have the first team focused on the in, in independent system operator uh, first, then talking to the distribution, which I believe is where the, mostly the sense of agency is. The money is not, there's a lot of billions that is not coming in from the distribution side, and that is where the customer is. But at this point in time, we are starting at transition level and independent an independent system operator. So for me, I, I think and I believe that the, the unbundling should have looked at the distribution side of things at this point in time because that's where money is not coming in and that is where the dynamics are in terms of the current transition that we, we're going through as the, as the industry. It's not happening at generation level, it's not happening at transition level, it's happening at distribution where everything is becoming decentralized. So focus on distribution first. That is that will be my, uh, my 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 response. In terms of the disadvantages, I haven't seen much because there are assumptions around a uh, loss of jobs. But for me, if you look at ESCOM as it is now, it's already unbundled. ESCOM has separated its business unit. What would make um, what would cause loss of jobs if ESCOM was to be, uh, you know, unbundled into the entities at this point in time. Rather than you'll be adding new board members on those entities. There won't be, loss of, there won't be any loss of jobs, but just to add more board members on these entities. That, that's how I look at it. But uh, in closing, please look at the position. That's where the dynamics are at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nslanjla. I believe Vuvu is back on the line. So, uh, Vuvu, if you can please uh, commence with your opening statement. Apologies, everyone. As I was about to speak about digitization, my Skype call died, the irony of it all. But I was just quickly going through just some key trends that we're tracking as a company and understanding how these translate into the different markets that we operate in. So starting with decarbonization, um, the need to reduce greenhouse gases is a priority for all of us in the energy system. So efforts to reduce emissions have influenced 
the preference of renewables, gas and hydro as part of a more environmentally friendly energy mix. Additionally, the development of new technologies that harness digitization will eventually lead to further decarbonization. Um, as far as digitization goes, while the Internet of Things adoption in Sub-Saharan Africa is relatively new compared to other emerging markets, one should not underestimate the transformative potential of these technologies. So leveraging emerging technologies will drive innovation and advancements that are needed. We see this in Kenya, where the m platform that offers retail financial services via mobile phones has enabled companies to provide rent-to-own solar energy solutions for off-grid population through access to mobile money payment. These new solutions are decentralizing finance and energy solutions that are traditionally provided by large commercial banks and central utilities. And then the idea of decentralization, which one of my speakers touched on. Globally, the power landscape has been transformed by the arrival of increasingly affordable distributed power technologies. So with diverse fuel options and flexible configurations, these technologies have been key in driving trends to smaller decentralized power systems. And while these decentralized power technologies do not produce significant generation output, their primary benefit is their ability to accelerate access to populations, especially populations in remote areas. So collectively, we need to understand how do we respond to these mega trends as a region and as a country. So how do we position, for example, you know, a digitization solution in a country that is only operating on a 3G network? How do you even punt the idea of decarbonization in a country like Malawi, which has less than 10% electrification? Or how do you even speak about, you know, being environmentally friendly in a country that is reliant on reset engines running on diesel as their main source of power? Obviously, our challenges in South Africa are different. Um, what we're seeing are different from what we're seeing in the rest of the region. But as you all know, with regional integration, we can't separate ourselves from what is unfolding around us, particularly within the static region. So our energy dynamics are ranging from anything from an aging coal fleet COP21 obligations, an influx of renewables, and thousands of laborers who have to be reskilled for the green economy. And then this needs to be balanced against externalities such as potentially importing significant amounts of dollarized gas from either the region or further afield, and then meeting some of our bilateral obligations. For example, we have committed to be an off-taker to INGA. And then with our preoccupation with ESCOM, we shouldn't forget that there are seven other countries within SADC who rely on ESCOM just as much as we do. So just to summarize, one can never overlook the incredible, difficult balance our government has to achieve in solving for a continuously shifting power industry. And we collectively need to solve for these challenges. Um, we need a skilled workforce, flexible solutions, both technology and funding, and a genuine willingness to partner as equipment providers, EPC lenders, and government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivu. Um, I think that's really interesting that you are talking about the, all the smart solutions. Uh, I'd like to now continue with our Q&A, uh, where we are addressing the questions that came in from our listeners when they registered. Uh, to continue with the first question that I had asked around what are the disadvantages of unbundling ESCOM, uh, Naraj, would you like to respond to that as well? Yes, I see that there's a specific question that is talking about unbundling of ESCOM and whether it would serve any purpose in addressing the current financial situation. Now, actually, we need to be very clear here that, you know, unbundling of ESCOM into different entities with an independent system operator would not necessarily serve the financial or solve the financial issues that ESCOM is currently facing. However, this unbundling is more of a futuristic approach. Now, as uh, one of my presenters rightly mentioned, there is a large amount of dependency on ESCOM, and ESCOM has to be a part of the solution going forward. But we also need to ensure that ESCOM operates in a sustainable manner, wherein you know it stays relevant even 8 to 10 years down the line where we are talking about decarbonization we are talking about digitalization and also decentralization so 
I think unbundling of ESCOM and ensuring that it stays relevant to these changes in the electricity supply industry that we are seeing is necessary to ensure that ESCOM stays a part of the solution in the future and it has a viable business model going forward as well. As I again rightly mentioned, it is not a quick fix solution to the current financial situation, but it is more of a forward thinking approach where we ensure that ESCOM stays relevant not only for South Africa, but for the entire SADC community. Thank you so much, Naraj. Um, we've had a lot of questions coming in around uh, the energy mix. So, Vubu, I'd like to, to ask you uh, a question uh, that addresses this particular challenge, and that what is South Africa's best option for baseload? Uh, and the uh, audience member asks, given the risk around um, climate change and the legacy of coal in this country, Right. So I think we need to start with balance. Access to a reliable, accessible, and affordable energy mix requires a balanced approach. And this means leveraging both locally available fuel sources and also utilizing the most modern and innovative technologies to achieve the least cost energy for the population. And I think what I'm describing now is aligned to the pillars of the 1998 White Paper on Energy Policy for South Africa. Um, it's about access, affordability, sustainability, and security. Now, when speaking about energy security, it's important that we understand that the over-reliance on a single fuel source is not viable long-term. We've seen this in our neighboring countries who are heavily reliant on, on hydro. Um, and the same can be said with us being totally or dominantly reliant on coal. A balanced energy mix in South Africa will have base load, I would imagine, of clean coal. And the successful incorporation of renewables, we need to consider grid, grid stability. So there enters gas, which will bring in the flexibility we need to ramp up and ramp down faster. And then we'll start to see new technologies coming to the fore, um, such as battery storage. Um, but it takes time, and it's a balancing act, because apart from just the energy mix, there's the consideration around the environment. So implementing whatever solution or plan that we have in place as a country needs to take into account cost and environment as well. Um, and I think it's important for each country uh, to identify what works for them given their resources, their capabilities in country and the needs. Certainly for South Africa, we have an abundance of a variety of resources, but these also need to consider that South Africa has a strong development agenda. We need to create employment. We need to upskill a lot of laborers who need to be reskilled from the coal and mining sector into the green economy. So whatever energy mix and strategy we take, we should not forget that there is a development agenda that the country also needs to prioritize in parallel. Thank you so much, Vivu. Um, I would like uh, to ask a, a question that has just come in uh, to Nshlanja, and this is specific to municipalities. And the question is, what are municipalities doing regarding non-payment of electricity bills by low-income customers? Uh, you know, talking about uh, keeping a municipality uh, operating at an optimal level, this is of great concern. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I think we, we need to acknowledge also that the current fiscal, fiscal framework and the funding model of municipalities is needs to change drastically as well. Because over 20, over 20 years ago, when municipalities were formed, the fiscal framework was based on the fact that municipalities must make money through their trading services that include electricity, and it was assuming that the municipalities, customers, and citizens served by the municipalities will all have the buying power or the purchasing power for electricity. But that's not the case. We find that the municipalities have more poor customers than the paying customers. So 
you can tell by exactly the change that we are going through at this point in time, even electricity has become very expensive. And that means even the government policy program for extended services must be reviewed to talk to maybe let's look at the customers that are poor and are not able to pay for these current exorbitant prices of electricity. Let's see how we can get them off the grid while giving them sustained energy. Because I think that would actually reduce the burden from the municipalities themselves in terms of uh, supplying the people who are actually not paying. And that's where even the theme of electricity comes. Because you connect with someone to the grid, someone you know very well is not working and it will not be able to pay at the a, a month end. So this means now the customers will actually start stealing electricity or even bypassing. So the municipalities at this point in time with the policy, uh, they are able to do not much in terms of changing the landscape, especially where the poor customers are concerned. The grant system needs to also be reviewed to talk to the current changes and also review the fiscal framework to talk to the current situation around the municipalities, customers, and the demographics in the municipalities. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Um, I've got a very interesting question that I'd like to address to Naraj, uh, and that looks at when will we see microgrids implemented in South Africa? I think it is a, a challenge that we are seeing specifically in our country that other countries seem to be progressing with quite uh, dramatically, whereas we seem to stagnate. Uh, thank you for that question, Nicolette. So, if, if you're looking at the development of microgrids, I think uh, you are spot on in that aspect when we say that microgrids have progressed at a faster pace, especially in Eastern Africa. We have examples in Kenya and Tanzania wherein, you know, the, the, the government has gone ahead and provided licenses to companies like Power Hive that now operate their microgrid as an independent private power utility. So, when we are looking at the South African perspective specifically, it is it is not necessarily uh, the case that microgrids have not come into play in South African environment. We have a, a recent example where an ESCOM has actually successfully demonstrated the use of solar and battery-based storage for operating somewhere around 32 kilowatt of peak load in one of uh, the free state uh, regions. So this has been successfully demonstrated and uh, there are more projects that are in the pipeline on a similar scale. Prior to this, we also have seen, you know, the adoption of microgrids on the industrial side of things. Now, we would not define it exactly as a microgrid because it is not specifically meeting the purpose of something like rural electrification that microgrids actually address, but then it was more from the perspective of grid stability. So we had a couple of copper mines that were actually using gas and diesel generator sets to operate a microgrid in a remote location. So one of the biggest reasons, you know, for microgrid development or, uh, you know, the non-development of microgrids in South Africa would be you know, also look at, looking at the current situation, when we compare South Africa to something like East Africa, Kenya, or Tanzania, we are looking at a higher percentage of, uh, you know, lack of rural electrification. You know, the, the rural electrification rates in East African nations are much on the lower side when we compare that to South Africa. So the need for microgrids for rural electrification in South Africa has not developed as much as it was seen in East Africa specifically. So that is one of the reasons I can see that, you know, uh, microgrids have not taken off the way they have taken off in the East African region specifically. But yes, there need to be regulations in place that would, you know, uh, move investments away from having in place lengthy transmission infrastructure and focusing more on using the local resources to actually develop microgrids specifically from the rural electrification perspective. Thank you so much, Naraj. I'd like to now welcome our fourth guest speaker, Silas, uh, who has now just dialed in. H Hello, Silas, are you there? Hi, hi, everybody. Sorry for joining you late. 
Not a problem. Silas, do you want to start off uh, very briefly giving uh, your opening statement uh, how you see the market at the moment in South Africa? Yeah, I think uh, you know the South, South Africa on energy is, is especially electricity is still the biggest in, in the continent, and unfortunately South Africa is now faced with um, an interesting challenge of of rephrasing and reframeworking itself, and this happens at a time that the rest of uh, the continent has not even got more than 10,000 megawatts in each country. But uh, I believe that uh, there's a lot of um, learning points to, 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 to take from South Africa for the rest of the continent. The, the fact that uh, we have, for since 2006, having a demand that's higher than the supply means we are forced to look at other things. So renewables um, uh, are already here. The private sector is already participating. So it's not a matter of privatizing or who is doing what. So. Through the IPP office, we've got those uh, renewable projects. The scary part, especially with the 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 the, the unbundling of ESCOM, is that you know we we've always had a weaker group in the industry called the distribution group. Our distribution industry is very very weak. So the unbundling is actually going to expose the distribution industry. I don't see how the distribution industry is going to. Um, be able to raise funds with high um, uh, non-technical losses uh, that, that it got. I mean, uh, and there's lots of reasons for that non-technical uh, uh, losses that they have, but they're just too high. No fund that would fund any distributor. So what is happening now uh, is that uh, there's lots of people that are taking the key customers of municipalities and ESCOM away from the grid, whether we like it or not, whether it's a part of the IRP or not, it's happening. It's going to be difficult to, to, to challenge. It's going to be unconstitutional to even stop people from putting solar roofs on their, on their houses because it's in the constitution that uh, people must have access to energy. But the supply of energy is saying, use less, I don't have enough. So what should people do? They're going. Uh, 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 through their own generation, and, and, and it's quite interesting. It's going to create a lot of unexpected new jobs. It's going to create a lot of unexpected new wealth, uh, and I'm starting to be excited about it, actually. Yeah, that, that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Silas. That's uh, a very key point that you've made, the exciting times that we are living in. Our customers and now have a choice, and this is forcing the market to change. Uh, but before we continue with, uh, looking at that changed market, I have a question for Vuvu, and uh, this is around uh, generation. So the question from our audience member is, is generation from natural gas really viable in South Africa? So my short answer is yes, there is place for gas in our energy mix. Now, how we solve for where that gas comes from is a different conversation. But what we can also see is that there isn't really a gas-based economy currently in South Africa. So our country is caught in an impasse between developing domestic gas, um, which depends on you know, a number of, of variables, or developing gas distribution infrastructure. Um, and this would be dependent on the existence of local demand. So the gas to power program, which the Department of Energy was looking to run, is intended to break this impasse. Um, in fact, it's no longer a gas to power, but a fully fledged gas program. Um, and a successful gas program uh, will for now, at least in the short term, rely on imported LNG. Um, although South Africa has existing gas infrastructure, it has no LNG importation capability. So this will have to be developed. Um, so I think as a country, we have to consider a, a cradle-to-the-grave solution. The development of the gas import infrastructure, delivering of the gas, processing the gas, and utilizing the gas for industry and power generation. Um, there are obviously fears around us dollarizing our economy with significant amounts of, of gas. Um, but what we all know for a fact is that LPG and LNG um, and other alternative forms of gas will always be significantly cheaper than the diesel, which is currently running in our system, 
uh, operating the peakers and for other uses. So I think we shouldn't be fearful of gas being uh, a commodity that is not derived from our shores at the moment, um, but it certainly has a place in our energy mix and in industry in general. Yeah, if I can add. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess, uh, I Silas, do you want to respond to that? Yes, I think uh, I just want to add, you know, the, the, the low-hanging fruit is actually going into Mozambique, establishing gas-to-power plant there. We already have uh, capability on the transmission network, but even if we, we don't have enough, we can do transmission lines quicker. That's our baby. We know how to do transmission lines. And then connect not only South Africa, so it depends on what you want the gas for. But if, if, if it's gas to, to power, we really don't need the, 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 to worry too much about the pipeline from Mozambique to Arabia. That's going to take too long. While that pipeline has been built, we can actually partner with Mozambique, have a, 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 a gas to power power station either in Mozambique or across the border on our side, and make sure that Zambia, Mozambique, uh, uh, Swaziland, uh, and, and the rest of our Southern uh, Development Corporation is, is, is covered. I mean, for me, that's a low, low hanging fruit. Thank you yeah. so much for responding to that as well, Silas. Um, I have a, a question here which uh, is addressed specifically to Nshlanchla, and that is around, is there work being done to aid the municipality not individual cases, but the entire South African municipal model in developing and exploring new models for resource provision. And this is looking at electricity, water, internet access, um, all of that infrastructure that considers all our various resources and dynamics of the end user. Uh, that um, is quite an in, in important question in Schlanschla. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It, it's quite a very important question. And uh, coincidentally, I was asked the very same question at Sustainability Week yesterday in CSIR. I, I think at this point in time, we are lacking a strategy going forward for the, you know, the utility of the future for the country. I think we are lacking on that. And this is for this reason why Salka is taking a lead on this work where we are forming an energy reform uh, group or energy reference group that is going to have six uh, work streams which are going to be looking basically at the work that was done by the EBI holdings, this contract, this contract, this contract that work, and uh, look at the structures going forward, uh, look at the new business models and the policies that need to support that, including energy uh, planning, Look at digitization, um, innovation, and technology, and also look at the capacitation of the industry as well. Uh, look at the fiscal framework, as I talked about the fiscal framework, and lastly, look at the government issues that we have in municipalities, including policy and regulation. So, all those work streams are going to form part of this energy reform commission that Salka is forming to lead the discussion or the framework of engagement to government, for government to start, you know, uh, adopting that kind of program as its aim or as its program to take forward to reform the energy industry. And here, if I'm saying energy, I'm even including what? I'm including gas and I'm including electricity. We really do not have the strategy to turn around things. And Salta is taking a lead with that uh, by forming this structure, which will be disruptive uh, in a positive way uh, in the position of government uh, going forward around the reforms that are needed uh, in the utilities. It might be water utility or gas utility or the energy utility as well. I think that's my short answer. Thank you so yeah. much. Naraj, I'd like to um, address a question to Yes, hello? No, I was saying, you know, the... Silas, would you the, like to respond? Yes, yes. Just to add to Ntanka, I think we also have to be fair to ourselves. A lot of uh, work needs to be done where we correct the wrongs that we have at the moment. 
before we can say remodeling and all that. I mean, if you go around, I've been driving around the country, street lights are on during the day, they're off at night. I mean, there's technology to start with simple things. That's a basic thing to, to, to street lights are there to help with security and safety at night, but they're not working. Now, how much can we save if we can get all of these street lights automated and then that municipality, whether we like it or not, not many municipalities uh, are recovering the street light costs, okay? And the street light costs, uh, capital costs have been paid for through the municipal infrastructure, infrastructure grant, but there's no tariff for it. But ESCOM is charging the, the same municipality for the usage of street light energy. So let's start with the things that we see every day, guys, before we look at what else can we do. Because if we can get our basics right, then it will be easy to have uh, our resources targeted at other new ways of doing things. But um, like Encanta has said, we are forced to change the model, guys. Whether we like it or not, uh, it's not like in the cell phone industry where it's going to change itself. With energy, we have to change it. And, and, and I'm glad that more and more people, even as, as municipalities, are seeing that as a, as a new uh, energetic challenge that they, they have to change how they're doing things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silas. Uh, Naraj, I have a question for you, and I'm addressing this question to you because of your uh, international perspective. Uh, and this is around uh, educating the end consumer. And what should we be doing to ensure that they understand the energy mix and what is involved in unbundling a sector and what they can do from their end? Right. If you are looking specifically from the end user perspective, as many of uh, my guest speakers here, here have mentioned, they have actually spoken about, you know, looking at the least cost of generation. So now end users are basically looking at options and opportunities that, you know, would result in them being slightly independent. I would not say completely independent from the grid, but would be slightly independent from the grid and also allow them to manage their own power generation, their loads, and also their internal facilities, while at the same time also having the opportunity to be connected to the grid, wherein they can meet their requirements just in case there is some failure with their internal systems. So when we are specifically looking at the right kind of mix, I would say, you know, it, it is it is a very tricky question to look at. This will vary as per geographies. This will vary as per the economic situation. And when we speak about South Africa or when we're trying to compare South Africa with some of the developed economies in the Europe, there is no comparison. It's like comparing apples to oranges specifically. So the right kind of energy mix that we are looking at should be structured around the local conditions. Now, in some of the urban areas of South Africa, like Cape Town, Johannesburg, we can also look at development of virtual power plants, wherein commercial and residential high-rises can actually have their own generation entities where they feed into the grid and there is a central control network that actually ensures that the grid is maintained in the right way. So we can look at development of virtual power plants within the city limits. Then we can also look at, as uh, we spoke previously, we can look at moving away from transmission infrastructure and focusing on development of rural microgrids. And then again, as I rightly mentioned previously, ESCOM has to be a part of the solution when it comes to peak load requirements or also matching the base load requirements. So the combination has to be, uh, you know, a mix of all these factors, while my guest speaker rightly mentioned also addressing the low hanging fruits that are there, where you're talking about automation, addressing the current issues and inefficiencies when it comes to losses in terms of electricity theft or electricity lost due to inefficient operation. So the start should be from, you know, addressing those issues that can realize immediate returns and then moving up higher in the order that require a certain amount of investment, but are the future of the energy mix. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Silas. Do you want to respond? Yeah, I think firstly, we have to educate our customers. Somebody has to pay for it. 
We used to do it so well years ago, uh, and that, uh, we, I don't know why it stopped. So educate our customers, allow for uh, uh, the, the, the feeding into the greed uh, principle to be, to be allowed, because that, that, that's an interesting one, because we're struggling to create jobs. So if we can have people feeding into the grid, we're actually creating wealth. People don't have to leave their houses to, to get money. You know, utilities can pay for the, for, for, for the energy that they can generate. So that, that to me is another exciting way of, of, of helping a country that is not uh, growing that much on, on its GDP. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's been such an interesting discussion, and there is so many more questions uh, coming through. However, we are almost running out of time, so I'm going to ask each of our guest speakers to give uh, a final thought uh, to how they see this market unfolding. And I'd like to start with Nshlanshla. If you could please give your very quick final thought to our audience. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, I think my uh, uh, parting statement would be, um, at this point in time, um, let us look at the reforms that are needed uh, in a holistic uh, kind of way. Uh, let's not do a reform in isolation to the other. Uh, I think we will find bigger problems very later in the day, at the stage of, of doing reform if we are doing things in isolation. And hence, as the country, we need to have a strategy of a future power electricity supply industry of South Africa. At this point in time, there is no strategy for that. We only have an integrated resource plan that is just talking about the landscape of the energy in the country going forward. But we do not have the strategy for how are we going to respond to the current uh, fundamental changes that the energy industry is going through. And this is why Salga is trying to lead the discussion by forming the energy reform uh, group or commission to create a framework of engagement to government, for government to adopt a program uh, of, 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 of developing a strategy to turn around the industry and to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Vivo, what are your final thoughts on this topic? Um, I would just say in closing that our, our contribution as industry incumbents is essential. Um, we cannot continue to have such an over-reliance on government to solve for everything. So in addressing the power challenges, we need to have a clear path to achieving reliable and where possible indigenous solutions. Um, and this needs to be done simultaneously while creating jobs and developing critical skills needed to drive continuous growth in our energy ecosystem. Thank you so much. Niraj, um, your final thoughts uh, from an international perspective. Yeah, so as uh, I mentioned previously, uh, unbundling of ESCOM is essential, but ESCOM has to be a part of the solution going forward. And we need to ensure the fact that ESCOM is prepared to face the challenges of the future. Challenges in terms of, you know, being a part of a customer-centric electricity supply industry, being a part of the renewable energy and energy storage mix, and also providing solutions that would have an impact not only on the economy directly, but also on customers. So that would also include digitalization and decarbonization as a big aspect. Now, what we need to be looking at specifically is that ESCOM needs to ensure its sustainability in the future, but there also needs to be competition in the market from the generation and the distribution side, which will ensure that the economy is boosted by competitively priced electricity that is available in the market, and this electricity is also reliable. So competition is essential, and to just to end uh, in the right note, in a positive note, there are many opportunities that ESCOM and South Africa can attain and address in the future. Thank you so much, Naraj. And Silas, your final thoughts for our for our listeners. Yeah. 
I see uh, a generation space which has got um, uh, more new IPPs coming in. I don't see ESCOM being replaced on the generation side. They're just too big and they are very important. I see a transmission that would definitely have uh, a market operator, what we call the the ISMO in uh, in, in in our in our in our, in our space. Uh, the distribution side, I, I actually see less of the utilities being involved, uh, and I see more individual small companies, customers themselves generating for themselves. It's already happening. All the the, industry, the commercial businesses in Johannesburg are going partly off grid. It's a big concern. These guys contribute 70 percent plus of the revenues of ESCOM and municipalities, and they will never recover from that. So it's better that we actually ask ESCOM and the municipalities to adopt these technologies and be the ones that are actually distributing the technologies, because. People have got more belief in municipalities and ESCOM than to the individual silences that want to be doing all these solar roofs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silas. Uh, to our listeners, I trust that some of your questions and concerns have been addressed in our live broadcast today. And just a reminder that you will be able to listen to it again uh, on our website as from tomorrow and have access to all of the presentations that our guest speakers had put together. So my thanks to our four guest speakers for giving their time and knowledge and to you, our listeners, for tuning in today for this live broadcast brought to you by ESI Africa and the African Utility Week and PowerGen Africa Conference. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you.